Hello, BookTube. Uh, the other day, Michael K. Vaughn made a video about books that should be Penguin Classics, but aren't. Books that should be, if in a perfect world where he had complete editorial control over inclusion and copyright and uh, the rights, buying the rights with money, uh, that should be included in the Penguin Classic reprint line, one of the most famous reprint lines in the world, uh, but that for one reason or another weren't. And uh, uh, Mark at Book Time with Elvis made a response video, and so did Drunzo, and I just saw that Sean D. Stanfast has weighed in, and I made a response video with a whole bunch of books that I thought should be Penguin Classics and got a ton of emails. I got a ton of comments on that video as well. But I got a ton of emails from people as well saying, please don't stop. Because at the end of that video, I said that I could keep going. The video is almost an hour long, and I could have easily kept going. Uh, picking books, not necessarily books that I love, but books that for one reason or another, either their importance or their influence, their cultural cachet, whatever it is, uh, I would love to see in the Penguin Classic line. And the only thing that was missing from that video that I did was that Cool Kids app that changes any book into a Penguin Classic, that, that creates a Penguin Classic cover for any book that you want to nominate. Uh, I had a few people send me links to various sites that would do that, and at first, as usual, because I'm Grandpa Simpson, I thought those sites were incomprehensible and would never work for me. Uh, but I got one to work. And I have a ton more candidates, so I thought I would do uh, books that are not Penguin Classics but should be part two. This time, it's personal. <laughs> Uh, we're going to start, I made lovely Penguin Classic covers, well I wouldn't govern if these were real, we're going to start with one of the two great political novels uh, in American literature. Uh, America is a politics-obsessed country, and yet uh, most political novels in America are bad. Uh, this is one that's great, this is All the King's Men by Robert Penn Warren. Look at that, looks just like a Penguin Classic, oh my god, I'm blocking the beam. Will it work on this side? A little work good enough, sure. A little bit of reflection, but that's the price you pay for wanting to see yourself. Uh, this is a, a great, tragic, dark political novel based on uh, Huey Long, a, a Southern American uh, politician, but you don't need to know anything about Huey Long to read this book and love it. It is harrowing. Uh, then uh, an ancient work that has almost never been translated into English and certainly never been translated into a popular edition anywhere that I know of in English, and certainly it's never been part of Penguin, which is really kind of weird. Penguin does pretty well with classics of the ancient world. This is Attic Nights by Aulus Gellius, and it is a, a weird hodgepodge of things. It's a collection of little bits and pieces, uh, excerpts from much longer works, uh, presses from authors that he really likes or really doesn't like, bits that he finds funny, that sort of thing. We, we find it immensely valuable now, classicists do, because a, a great many of the authors that Alice Gellius mentions and also excerpts don't survive anywhere else. The, old, we're, the only reason we even know they exist is because of him. But it makes for very interesting reading. It's a very interesting book. There's a low classical library edition, but there should be a new translation for Penguin Classics with an introduction and notes, chase down all of his illusions, tell us all about what we know and don't know about these books, uh, and there isn't. Uh, then a, a classic of anthropology, something that is, uh, was for a long time seminal, and it, for that fact, is often over, it's often overlooked how well written it is, and that is Margaret Mead, Coming of Age in Samoa, uh, which is, uh, I think, in common domain, it's certainly very old, 100 years old, or maybe a little bit less than that, and w imagine getting the right person to write an introduction uh, highlighting the significance of this work. I, that would be wonderful. Uh, then we have another American classic. Uh, uh, All the King's Men by Robert Penn Warren is a great American novel of the 20th century. There are probably 10. It's one of them. Uh, and there's another one uh, that is a great American novel of the 20th century uh, that is not in Penguin Classic. I'm pretty sure that its copyright is zealously protected. This is Thomas Wolfe's Look Homeward Angel. Uh, a great big, brawling, mostly autobiographical novel that has its, uh, its writing style, I think, would strike a 21st century audience as oratund, as very ornate, uh, but beautiful. 
and overwhelmingly powerful. Oh my God, there are some scenes in here that are overwhelmingly powerful. Uh, I would call both it and All the King's Men quintessential Southern male fiction. Uh, but uh, this next one, uh, I said at the beginning of this video that not all of these were personal favorites of mine, <laughs> and some of them won't be. Uh, but I figure as long as I'm making this list, and I admit, because I was a little kid on Christmas morning, uh, enraptured with this website to make Penguin Classic covers. You really should look up one of those websites and try it. If I can do it, you can do it. Uh, and I want everybody to do this, of course, but uh, naturally I had to include a favorite. This has no literary merit at all, but plenty of books that Penguin publishes have no literary merit. I mentioned The, the Mysteries of Paris yesterday uh, when I was advocating Varney the Vampire. Varney the Vampire seems like Les Miserables compared to this. This is Meg by Steve Alton. And it is it is a novel about a giant fifty foot phosphorescent megalodon shark that survives to the present day first of all in the Marianas Trench and makes its way to the surface where no one is safe <laughs> because it's five times longer than a great white shark and of course because it's a giant shark novel five times more intelligent five times more malevolent five times better a long term planner. <laughs> Sort of thing. Uh, then this next one, I honestly don't know why there hasn't been a classic edition here. I really don't. On one level, I could guess at a reason, but the reason is so vain and shallow that I'd like to think that places like Oxford or Dover or Penguin would be above it. And that shallow reason would be embarrassment, <laughs> because this is one of the greatest literary hoaxes in all of Western literature. And this is the Poems of Ossian. There was no Ossian. The, this was, the author McPherson here was, was serially forging not only a diction and literary illusions, but also a literary identity. And no one knew that for a long time. There were a whole bunch of, of great literary anthologies from the day, 200 years ago, 100 years ago, that include poems by Ossian, innocently. They had no idea that this was uh, a fraud, a hoax. Oh, are you moving me? If you're moving, then I can put these over here. What you doing, baby? Huh? Oh, there you go. You don't want to lay down there for you to believe me. <laughs> She's laid down next to me. Uh, but that's not going to work. <laughs> it's not going to work at all. Uh, not on a day like this. Not even in AC. She likes to be laying next to me, but uh, I have an extremely high body temperature. She's not going to stay there more than a few seconds. Uh, but anyway, as I was saying, get... Uh, a new introduction and new notes and dissect the importance of these poems instead of relegating them to the trash heap because the author pulled a fast one. I, I just, I don't get that. The, the, the poems of Ossian are still, it'd be a big Penguin classic, but the poems of Ossian are still literarily important, whether they were a fraud or not. <laughs> so, uh, uh, and then this next one, uh, we'll go back to the ancient world again. Again, strange to me that this has never had a popular edition. Uh, I'm pretty sure that Oxford has never done it. I'm pretty sure that, uh, I know that Penguin has never done it. And they should. This is a long epic poem, a very long epic poem. This is uh, the Punica of Silius Italicus. I'd like to think again, the reason why this has not been reprinted is not that the author's name is Silius. I'm hoping that, I, I'm hoping I can expect better than that from the publishing world. But isn't it neat how this app makes Penguin classics? That's just incredible. I'm never going to live to see what this looks like any of these. How wonderful to be able to just make them. That's just great. Uh, I'm not saying that the Punica is, uh, it's obviously you can tell it's about the Punic Wars, Rome's wars against Carthage. And I'm not saying that it's great literature at all. Uh, but again, it, it's important simply by the fact that it's an, an epic that's arised from the ancient world. There were 10,000 of them, only about 200 survive. <laughs> so maybe that, and some only in fragments. It'd be it'd be nice if Penguin Classic printed a nice, accessible, paperback version of everything that survives from the ancient world, whether it's uh, Silius Italicus, whether it's Aulus Gellius. Maybe it's that it's the tail wagging the dog. Maybe they don't do this because their editorial people know that things like Aulus Gellius or the Punica are never taught in schools, which is where Penguin makes the bread and butter of their money. Maybe that's the case. But this is a dream, right? These videos are a dream. We're dreaming about what we'd like to see as Penguin Classics. I'm never going to see Meg in that line. <laughs> uh, then we have uh, a towering 
uh, bestseller, an absolute reading universal from the Middle Ages, from a thousand years ago, uh, The Romance of the Rose, uh, which is all about the nonsense of courtly love, but the, in The Romance of the Rose, in my, in my estimation, has never had an English language translation that does it justice. The two that I have read really creak. <laughs> they are really... I, you don't need to know anything about the original. You don't need to be able to read the original. To read one of those two translations into English, the ones that I guess would be the ones you'd most likely find at a used bookstore, and think, I don't know anything about the original, but this translation stinks. <laughs> because this would not have caught the imagination of an entire continent and held it for decades. It would not have spur uh, sparked tons and tons of imitators, tons and tons of acolytes. The thing that I'm reading in this creaky English translation would not do that. So what we need is a good English translation here. Uh, but then, why it's not in the Penguin line, I don't know. Uh, then we have, uh, if we start off with all the Kingsmen, we'll, we'll, we will uh, go on with the other great American political novel. There are only two. <laughs> Unfortunately, there are only two. Please don't... Uh, nominate things like primary colors. <laughs> okay, please don't do that. Uh, this would be the other one, and this is as comic as the uh, All the King's Men is tragic. And this is The Last Hurrah by Edwin O'Connor. Uh, a great comic novel set in a city that is Boston. It's never named, but it's clearly Boston. And featuring an old, battered, roguish politician, Frank Skeffington, who's going to make one more run for power. One last time. He knows he doesn't have more than that in him. But he thinks he'll do it one last time. Uh, since the novel is pretty clearly based on uh, James Michael Curley, I thought he, uh, he had the honor of having a place on the cover. Uh, I was going to put his, his mansion with the shamrock shutters on, on the Jamaica way in Jamaica Plain, but better the face, better the black and white. Uh, then we have something from the Italian Renaissance that is a gold mine to read. It's amazing to read, and again, that is only in a creaky English translation. Imagine what a really good translation would do to this work. But it's a goldmine because uh, there's virtually nothing like it for the Italian Renaissance. And this is this an author named uh, Vespania, Vespasiano de, de Bastici. Uh, we just call him Vespasiano. And he did a book uh, that I have called The Lives of Illustrious Men, uh, in which he puts out military leaders, condottieri, popes, prelates of all kinds, princes, and writes them up, Plutarch style, Suetonius style. It's remarkably enjoyable, and yet I only know of one English translation, and Penguin has never gone anywhere near it, as far as I know. And that's a shame. Imagine a nice big edition of this with new notes, a new introduction, new translation. It'd be utterly fascinating. Uh, then we have uh, something that has come close. This is a great American novel. I've had, we've had a couple so far, three in my opinion. Uh, it's difficult to call The Last Hurrah a great American novel because it's a comedy, uh, but it's beautifully done. It's just Great American novels tend to have this cachet of being brooding Heathcliff type figures. Uh, this is a great American novel and it's come close. It's had a, a modern classics, the Penguin modern classics edition with that puke green spine uh, but I don't want that. I want the black and white, the black spine penguin classic of the USA trilogy by John Dos Passos. Big, fat brick of a thing, but I'm not worried about that, not only because these videos are fantasies, but also because Penguin has already done this book. They have the plates for it and everything. All they would have to do is switch the cover, the cover design. They've already done this. They don't anymore. As far as I know, this book is not currently in print, unless it's the New York Review of Books or something like that. But that's a shame. Uh, because this is brilliant. Uh, I wonder how many more uh, great American novels I have on here. Probably not any. Uh, then this next one, I have praised this book many, many times. I'm not the only one. Many, many American writers in the last century have praised this book and this author as brilliant. Uh, and there is a, a standard, so sort of classical trade paperback of this that seems never to go out of print. But I want a Penguin edition with an introduction and notes and the whole thing. And that is West with the Night by Beryl Markham. Uh, I, I deliberately chose here a different cover from the classic cover that this book has had since it came out. There's a paperback that just never quits of this thing. And if you haven't read it, oh my, you are missing. It's a great adventure story, but it is also beautifully written. Just beautifully done. Uh, 
And then we have uh, uh, a classic that not many people have read, in my experience. I might massacre the author's name. It's a great big thing, but I think Penguin could probably do it in one volume. It would just be huge. It would be the size of Clarissa. Uh, and that is, uh, it's difficult to know what title to give it, The Writing on the Wall. Uh, it's a, the Transylvania, the Transylvanian trilogy or something like that. Transylvania trilogy sounds a little bit trite. Uh, but this is by Miklos Banfi. Uh, I put the, the titles here. Uh, they were counted, they were found wanting, they were divided. Those are the three volumes in the work. And each volume is fairly hefty in size. This would be a big volume. All about a vanished Hungary, vanished Hungarian society. Uh, deeply moving. I mean, it, it's usually portrayed, when it's portrayed at all, I don't know how many American reprints this has ever had. It's a great work. Uh, but usually when, the thumbnail that it's given is that it is a sweeping portrait of pre-war Hungarian society. But it's actually far more personal than that. The personal portraits in here are very, very akin to Anna Karenina. Uh, a, a cumulatively very powerful trilogy that that uh, doesn't have a popular edition, as far as I know. Maybe one of you can tell me that I'm wrong. Uh, I have not seen a popular edition. Uh, then we have uh, a memoir that is delightful. Absolutely delightful. This is Carlo Levi, Christ Stopped at Eboli, uh, that is uh, raucous and partisan, very maudlin in its way, but uh, it has staying power. This has had many, many, many paperback editions, unlike a lot of the books that I'm talking about here. This has been healthily reprinted in English. And I'm, I'm not 100% up on comparing the various translations that have appeared in English. Maybe one of them is good enough. I'm kind of thinking, since this is a fantasy series, since you can daydream all you want, I'm kind of thinking that when these books get editions, unless I have a specific scholarly edition in mind, I'm kind of hoping that they would all get new translations. Uh, new and fresh translations with new introductions, new notes, just new everything. The Penguin, of course, would never do that. That's why they buy old editions, to save on the money of commissioning something. Uh, but it, I haven't read uh, Christ Opt at Everly in, in quite some time. What a thrill it would be uh, to read it in a Penguin classic. That would be awesome. And then we can go to Ireland. This is a great towering work of Irish fiction. Uh, that just a few years ago had a couple of different new English translations. Surely one of those would work for the Penguin Classic line. Surely we need not commission a translator for this. And this it, there are various ways to translate the title out of the Irish. The, I, I'm going with Churchyard Clay by Martin O'Caden, uh, which is a, a fairly big, fairly involved, very darkly humorous novel, uh, all about the gossip that comes to the graveyard with each fresh body. This is a novel narrated by the dead uh, who remain very Irish, <laughs> despite the fact that they are dead. They are not transformed. <laughs> uh, and it ends up being mean and catty and at times beautiful. I, I was very happy to see it get a couple of dueling American editions. I don't remember right now off the top of my head who did either one of those. I think I wrote about one of them. Uh, but that just means there are English language translations out there that will work. So, so Penguin should hoover one of them up. Uh, then we have, is this the last one? Yeah, we'll finish up here because this one doesn't need to go to 50 minutes. Uh, and this is uh, The Horseman on the Roof by Jean Giono. And it is uh, a rollicking adventure story about a hussar, a mounted, about a soldier, a young, daring soldier. Hence, I put a hussar on the cover. Uh, it bears a lot of similarities to a couple of other books on this list, but maybe more similarities than anything to a pick that Mark at Book Time with Elvis did. He took it right out of my hands, or I would have done it, and that is The Four Feathers. Uh, sort of similar to that in many, many ways, although with a lot more uh, heartfelt local color, I guess, I would say. Uh, it, the, it, the Horseman on the Roof doesn't ride roughshod over its landscape the way the Four Feathers does, in my opinion. Uh, and it would capture a whole new audience. Again, give it a new translation, the whole nine yards, a new introduction, uh, and it would be a Penguin classic to be proud of. All of these would. That is a little list for you, a little addendum, part two of books that should be Penguin classics, but aren't yet. Quite a few candidates on this list that I think Penguin should seriously consider. Meg, 
notwithstanding. Uh, so uh, we, we got this done in under 40 minutes, which is great. <laughs> I could, as I said yesterday, oh my, could I go on. <laughs> there are so many candidates that come to mind. But this will do for now. <laughs> so I'll wrap this up for now, and I will see you soon. Thank you, BookTube.